it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's an honor to be giving the fifth annual Roebuck lecture. Now, I don't know Len Roebuck, but I do know his, uh, I guess, cousin, uh, Alan Roebuck, who's an atmospheric scientist at Rutgers University uh, and a good friend um, and, and a leading atmospheric scientist. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this issue of climate change. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it from uh, a somewhat unique perspective as a scientist who really never signed up to be in the center of the fractious uh, societal debate over climate change, but because of a graph of mine that has come to be known as the hockey stick because of its shape, uh, I found myself um, sort of uh, accidentally and uh, reluctantly uh, in the center of this larger debate over human-caused climate change and global warming and what to do about it. And so uh, tonight I'll, I'll talk about uh, you know, the underlying science and, and the impacts of climate change, but I'll also talk about the politics um, and uh, the various experiences that I've had um, at the center of some of uh, the politics surrounding uh, this issue and some of the experiences that I think I've learned from uh, being uh, in the public sphere um, and uh, being in, in a position to uh, try to inform this uh, discussion. Now, the first point that I want to make here is that the scientific case is actually quite straightforward. Now, you might not gather that uh, if you watch certain cable news networks. You might think <laughs> that there is uh, not, not to be named. Um, uh, you might think that there is a, a raging debate within the scientific community about climate change. Um, well, it, it turns out that the basic underlying science, the greenhouse effect, the, the fact that certain gases in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, have this warming influence on the surface of the Earth, that's not new controversial science. That's basic chemistry and physics that goes back to Joseph Fourier. Uh, for those of you who may not know, he was the one who discovered the law of heat conduction. Um, he was the one who discovered the Fourier series and the, the Fourier transform. This is science that goes nearly two centuries back in time. And the fact that we're increasing the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere, again, that's not in dispute. Now, this is one of those graphs uh, that you know, instantly becomes out of date as soon as you try to put together a nice depiction of this curve it becomes out of date. Um, in this case, it is now egregiously out of date. Uh, I constructed the graph a few years ago, but the vertical scale now needs another tick mark because we just passed for the first time last year the 400 parts per million CO2 level in the atmosphere. Pre-industrial levels were about 280 parts per million. We've just passed 400 parts per million. We think that we need to go back about five to 10 million years that's how far back you have to go in Earth's history to find CO2 levels that were naturally that high. So we are engaged in this unprecedented and uncontrolled experiment um, in how we are modifying the atmosphere. That's actually all you need to know, okay? The greenhouse effect, basic two century old physics and chemistry. The fact that we are increasing the concentration of these greenhouse gases in an unprecedented manner what I wouldn't be able to explain to you, what atmospheric scientists, what climate scientists would not be able to explain to you would be if the Earth were not warming up as a result of that. Uh, but of course, the measurements tell us that the Earth has warmed up, a little less than one degree Celsius so far, a degree and a half Fahrenheit. Now, the critics, and there, there are critics, believe it or not, um, will tell you, well, we don't trust those thermometer measurements. They're from you know, locations that uh, you know, are uh, corrupted by urban heat islands or they're measured with buckets in the ocean that uh, might have problems with them. Well, you could throw out all those measurements, okay? And there's nearly two decades that's been spent on quality controlling these data so that we um, do, uh, we are able to, um, to pretty confidently assess surface temperature changes from the thermometer measurements. You could throw them all out, and I could show you dozens of independent lines of evidence that would tell an internally consistent story of a planet that is warming up and a climate that is changing in much the way we expect it to as we continue to increase the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere. And so it's that sort of evidence that led the IPCC in its most recent scientific assessment, which came out just last fall, to conclude that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. 
What that means is when you go to the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union, you won't find sessions where scientists are debating whether the Earth is warming. If you open up a scientific journal and you leaf through it, there won't be articles questioning whether the Earth is warming. That's settled science. Now, is that all invalidated, on the other hand, by the fact that um, we had a pretty cold winter. It was cold here in, in, in Wisconsin. It was cold in Pennsylvania, where I live. It was cold in Peoria, Illinois. And in the eyes of some, certain news networks, certain individuals, my favorite is this tweet by Donald Trump. I can't actually read it in, uh, you know, <laughs> in, in public here. Um, so was the fact that we had a cold winter you know, disproof of climate change, of global warming. Well, let's actually look at the data. Let's look at you know, the frequency of extreme cold. And what I do now, everywhere I go and I give this lecture, I look at the local meteorological records, or as close as I can get to local, and I see what the trends are in the number of extremely cold days. And in Santa Cruz, where I was a couple months ago, well, no, it's declining. Extreme cold is getting less common. I was in Texas, central Texas, uh, a few months earlier, and it's declining there. Cleveland, a couple months ago, declining. Missouri, declining. Tampa, a couple weeks ago, uh, a week ago, uh, declining there. In Madison, guess what? It's declining in Madison, Wisconsin. It's even declining in the most important location of all, State College, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Everywhere I've been, cold records are declining. And guess what? Warm records? They're increasing. This is tabulating all of the records over the entire U.S. every day of the year in every location where temperature records are kept. How often do we break an all-time record for warmth and how rec uh, often do we break an all-time record for cold? And by the way, during that cold spell this winter, there wasn't a single all-time cold record that was set anywhere in the U.S. Last few summers, we've seen a number of all-time warm records fall. And in fact, now we are seeing warm records occur at twice the rate we would expect from chance alone. Um, so if you think about it, that's like a die. You roll a die and sixes are coming up twice as often as they should. Um, you would notice that loading of the die pretty soon if you were you know, making bets with it. And we are seeing the loading of the weather dice by climate change very clearly. Uh, and that's just really the tip of the iceberg as we'll see. We'll see much larger changes in the future if we continue on the course that we're on. Now, none of this is based on climate models. Uh, you'll also sometimes hear the critics claim that everything we know about climate change and global warming is based on these untested, unvalidated climate models. And that's doubly wrong, because they're not untested and unvalidated, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But it's not based on climate models. I already presented the evidence to you uh, earlier in the lecture. The fact that greenhouse effect, it's two-century-old science. We've known that for two centuries. Longer than we've known about the theory of evolution. <laughs> and believe it or not, certain news networks you might watch where even that's questioned as well. Um, in fact, my good friend Bill Nye uh, debated uh, that uh, proposition as well uh, a couple months ago. The Creation Museum. Uh, well, so climate models, you know, that's not the basis of the evidence. The evidence is the fact that the greenhouse effect, we know it exists. We're increasing the greenhouse effect by burning fossil fuels and engaging in other activities that are elevating the concentrations of these gases, and the Earth is warming up just as we expect it to. That's really all you need to know to understand that we are warming the planet and changing the climate. Now, we do use climate models because you know, this is our best way to ask what-if questions. We only have one climate. Um, there isn't another planet we can go to, by the way. There's no planet B. Um, it's the only planet we know of um, in the universe um, that is habitable to, uh, to life, although I, I just read today that apparently they did discover a, an Earth-sized exoplanet uh, in the habitable zone um, recently, and that's some light years away, so we probably won't get there too soon. We're involved in this unprecedented experiment, um, and if we want to ask questions like, well, what if we weren't increasing the concentrations of these gases, what would we expect? Um, what is the effect of natural factors? Um, to answer those questions, we need to use models 
that formalize our understanding of the way this system works. Uh, the atmosphere and the climate model is much like a numerical weather forecasting model, but when we're talking about the climate, we're not just talking about the atmosphere, we're talking about the oceans, we're talking about the ice sheets, we're talking about the interaction of various forms of radiation within and heat within the system. Um, so we're solving the laws of thermodynamics as well as the, the, the laws of um, dynamics. And we have to take into account the chemistry and even the biota, the uh, life uh, on Earth is one of the interacting components of the system. So we take our best conceptual understanding of the way these various components work and we bring it all together in a model that represents our best understanding of the way the system operates. And we make predictions with uh, these models. Now, at this point you might be wondering why I'm showing you the, the Seinfeld restaurant. Uh, well, in the upper floors of the Seinfeld restaurant sits the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is a climate modeling center. And when I see that, I think GIS, NASA GIS. I don't think Seinfeld. I did a sabbatical uh, there uh, about seven years ago. So I used to go to the Seinfeld restaurant for work every day for a few months. It was a lot of fun. Well, in 1988, three years before the Seinfeld show went on the air, Dr. James Hansen, uh, the director, former director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, was making predictions with climate models. And as the uh, great physicist Niels Bohr once famously said, predictions are hard, especially about the future. <laughs> it wasn't Yogi Berra, it was Niels Bohr, I promise you. And what he did back in 1988, and you can see the observations leading up to the prediction and how the globe was warming, and he ran his climate model three different times. Now this was a climate model that by today's standards is quite primitive. Um, in fact, I impressed my class by running in real time the NASA GIS climate model that was used for that experiment faster than Hansen was able to run it on a supercomputer back in 1988. It runs on this little laptop uh, quite a bit faster now. And even with this crude model, um, you can see, you know, reproduces the, the warming that had been seen, and he did three different simulations looking at three different scenarios, because after all, he couldn't predict human behavior. He couldn't predict if we would choose to rapidly curtail our burning of fossil fuels, the purple, rapidly accelerate our burning of fossil fuels even beyond the historical trend, the green, or sort of business as usual somewhere in between, the blue. Well, it turns out the scenario that we most closely followed was that blue scenario. That was the prediction that Hansen made for the actual burning of fossil fuels that we ended up engaging in in the decades ahead, and that's what actually happened. So I would say that's a pretty good prediction, decades into the future. Um, now, again, if you're a critic, you see the glass is half empty, you might look at that dip there and say, look, there was a big cooling in 1991, 1992. Ha, 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 you know, your climate model wasn't able to predict that. What good is it? And it is true, I have to concede, that uh, Hansen didn't have the foresight in 1988 to know that in 1991, Mount Pinatubo would erupt. Um, <laughs> and when it did, it would put large amounts of particulates into the lower stratosphere, sulfate particulates, that reflect some of the solar radiation back to space and they cool the climate uh, for a few years. What Hansen did know was that it would take about six to nine months for that volcanic aerosol cloud to spread around the globe and begin to have a, a cooling influence on the surface of the Earth. So he had the opportunity to make another prediction, to predict the cooling that would be expected given the estimated distribution of these volcanic particulates. And he predicted that the globe would cool by about a half a degree Celsius for a few years. What might look like uh, a flaw in his original prediction was actually an opportunity for another successful prediction. And I could spend an hour here boring you to tears with various model validation exercise, uh, exercises as summarized in the hundreds of pages of model validation um, in the various reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Suffice it to say that these models have been validated in a number of ways and there's reason to take them seriously. So let's use them to ask some of those what if questions. Again, if you're a critic, you might say, okay, well, the globe is warmed, but you know, what about those volcanoes you just talked about? You know, they, they come and go, they can cause the temperature of the earth to change. How, how come we don't know it's those volcanoes? Or the small but measurable changes in solar output uh, over time. Maybe it's these natural factors that are responsible for the warming. Well, we'll, we'll do that experiment. We'll take those natural factors because we can in, uh, estimate them pretty well, actually centuries back in time. Um, from satellite measurements, from ice cores, uh, from various means. 
and we can take the climate model and subject it to these natural factors and see what happens. And that's actually what happens. The climate model is one to cool over the latter part of the 20th century if fed only these natural factors because we had a number of big volcanic eruptions like that Pinatubo eruption and the El Chichon eruption of uh, 1982 um, that cooled the climate in the latter part of the century. Solar output has been flat or even slightly declining over the last decade. So you put those together and the globe wants to cool rather than warm. It's only when we put the human impact, in particular the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations from fossil fuel burning, that we are able to explain the warming that we've seen. And it's that sort of evidence, what we call detection and attribution, and they're much more formal ways of doing these comparisons that lead you know, organizations like the IPCC to conclude in their most recent report that it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. Now, if you know scientists, you probably know they don't like to use words like extremely, and they like, don't like to use words like dominant. Um, by nature, we tend to be fairly conservative. And this is a report, keep in mind, it's the consensus of you know, hundreds of scientists around the world. So it represents a sort of scientific lowest common denominator, what all of these scientists can agree to. It is by its nature a conservative report. And so it's really striking, actually, that that sort of language they're not saying, well, you know, human influences might have caused some warming. They're saying it is extremely likely, you know, a level of likelihood that exceeds 95% confidence, that human influence has been the dominant cause of the warming. And even here, the IPCC is hedging, as scientists like to do. They're sort of being um, reticent. Because if you read the technical chapter, it turns out what it demonstrates is that we are actually responsible for more than 100% of the warming that we have seen for the reason I just showed you. Natural factors were actually pushing us in the opposite direction. And uh, sulfate particulates produced by pollution were actually cooling the globe a little bit. And the greenhouse gases overcame all of that. And so in fact, we're responsible for more than 100% of the warming. And as those uh, pollutants subside, when we passed the Clean Air Acts in the 1970s here in the US, similar actions taken in other countries, um, we're slowly taking away that offsetting cooling factor, un unmasking even more of the warming that had actually been hidden. So what about our future? What about projecting our future? Well, you know, we could try to stop emitting carbon into the atmosphere right now, and in all likelihood, we would, uh, we would avoid warming the globe by more than two degrees Celsius. And we'll see that that's an important threshold, a two degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial time, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, is an amount of warming that many scientists have concluded is where we start to commit to some of the most dangerous and potentially irreversible impacts of climate change. But if we continue with business as usual, then we're probably somewhere in that red zone. We'll be four to five degrees Celsius warmer by the end of the century, seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you're talking about the Arctic, double that. 14 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit warming because of the amplifying factor of melting away ice, which leaves more of the, um, the Arctic Ocean uh, susceptible to being warmed by the sun. Well, I recently, in the latest issue of Scientific American, I actually have a, a piece, uh, the April issue of Scientific American, where I, I, I show that we can still avoid breaching that two degrees Celsius threshold, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, if we're going to do that, we need to get serious now in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And if we exceed that two degrees C warming, well, this is from the most recent. Uh, the IPCC publishes three different reports, the, the basic science, and that came out last fall. The impacts of climate change came out a few weeks ago. And the uh, mitigation um, solutions to climate change, that just came out this week. This is from the impacts report that came out a couple weeks ago. And here you can see that uh, two degrees Celsius warming. And so what's showing with this thermometer scale is where do we start to commit to some dangerous impacts on water, land, food, health, our economy, national security, ecosystems, the health of our global ecosystems. Where do we start to see damaging impacts? And it turns out at about two degrees C is where you're pretty much headed into the orange or red in every one of these categories. And you're getting pretty close to the purple in some of them. 
It's a reasonable definition of what we might define as dangerous human interference with the climate. But perhaps a better way to demonstrate that is with pictures that depict the sort of planet that we're talking about. If we proceed with business as usual and we warm the planet by 4 to 5 C, 7 to 9 Fahrenheit by the end of the century, then we will, in the words of uh, my colleague James Hansen, who I mentioned earlier, be leaving behind a different planet for our children and grandchildren. It will not be the same planet that we grew up on. I used to end it with the polar bear. My daughter has two stuffed polar bears. We all love the polar bears. But it occurred to me, and it occurred to many of us, that by making the polar bear the iconic image of climate change, we've perhaps unwittingly sort of miscommunicated what climate change really means to us. Because it's not just some abstract problem that'll influence creatures that most of us have never seen in the wild anyway, decades from now. It's something that, as concluded in that impacts report of the IPCC that just came out, it is impacting us now, here, where we live. Um, it's already having harmful impacts when it comes to food and water and land and human health. Uh, in a sense, uh, we are the polar bear now. And so what I try to do everywhere I go now is talk about how climate change is impacting us, where we live now. This is uh, when I gave that talk in Central Texas. And I wanted an image of the 2011 Texas drought, this unprecedented drought. They lost 25% of their livestock in that drought, um, decimated agriculture through Texas, Oklahoma, the 2011 heat and drought episode. And so I found this image on the internet and it, depicting the 2011 drought. And I showed that in my presentation. And then somebody in the audience put it out. By the way, you know where that is, right? I was giving a talk in San Angelo, Texas. That's in San Angelo, Texas. That's what we used to call Lake Fisher. A few weeks later, I gave a talk in Maine. It was the day after this article came out in the New York Times about how climate change is impacting moose. And I know there are some moose in this state. Um, we're sort of in the moose territory, maybe in the, at least in the northern part of uh, Wisconsin. So everywhere in their range, in the US and Canada, moose are being impacted. Uh, warmer winters leading to greater affliction by pests. Um, and that's having an adverse impact on moose populations. Gave a talk in northwestern Missouri, northwestern Missouri state uh, a couple months ago, which it turns out is the bullseye of the 2012 Midwestern heat wave. Um, and you know, you guys saw some of that heat wave here. You're in the orange. Uh, well, you know, that was a record heat wave, or what we can call a typical summer day a few decades from now, if we continue with business as usual. And that's what the models tell us. That will be a typical summer day. California, record drought. There's an interesting debate going on right now in the climate research community. There was a paper that just came out in one of our leading journals uh, a few days ago demonstrating that the pattern, the jet stream pattern that gave us this unprecedented drought in California, um, extreme rainfall in the Pacific Northwest, record warmth in Alaska, and frigid con uh, conditions for the rest of us back east, that that atmospheric pattern may be more prevalent and it may be more intense because of global warming. There's some evidence that global warming could be amplifying that pattern. Um, and so that record drought in California, uh, I went up from Southern California then to Santa Cruz, and you can't go to Santa Cruz and not talk about the banana slug, right? Well, believe it or not, the banana slug is actually threatened by climate change in the sense that this fairly uh, fragile uh, atmospheric environment that maintains these, um, you know, these, uh, these redwood forests um, is susceptible to large scale atmospheric change. And, and that environment could easily disappear. Uh, and along with it, creatures like the banana slug. Uh, a week ago, like I said, I was down in uh, Florida. Um, and you know, they, this is an annual event. It's a seasonal high tide called the King Tide. Um, it happens every year, but it didn't used to flood the streets of Miami Beach every time it happens, which it now does. And because with sea level rise, what used to be you know, just a high tide is now a flooding high tide. And what is now a flooding high tide will be mean sea level in some matter of decades if we continue on this course that we're on. 
and in Tampa there was an article just earlier this year about the twin threats of rising sea level along with potentially more intense hurricanes, a double whammy in terms of the, the threat to our coastal environments. And here in uh, Wisconsin, um, there are a number of ways in which climate change is already impacting Wisconsin. There's a great effort here uh, at Wisconsin, um, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, to get it right, um, that is looking at various ways, you know, taking state-of-the-art climate model uh, projections, using appropriate techniques for translating them to regional scenarios and studying the impacts of climate change. So if the evidence is this clear, oh, and by the way, actually, I forgot the most important impact uh, that uh, climate change is having, global warming. Um, I was watching Fox News recently, and apparently palm trees have now reached uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> True? No? No? Was I, was I misled? Was I mis Maybe I can't trust everything. Anyways, um, so, the question then is, you know, if the evidence is this compelling, if the evidence is this clear, the impacts are already, you know, having dire consequences for us, um, why no action? Why have we seen no action on this issue? And of course, that takes us out of the realm of science and into the realm of politics. And as I mentioned before, um, I, you know, whether I like it or not, found myself in the center of some of those politics, uh, and I have some experiences that I'll talk about. Uh, but the first point I'll make here is that you know, that we have a vast infrastructure you know, for getting our energy from fossil fuels. And there is, you know, a very, um, there are powerful vested interests who understandably don't want to see that change. Uh, because in the words of uh, former President uh, George W. Bush, we are addicted to fossil fuels. And, you know, those vested interests who don't want to see us, you know, shift away from our reliance on fossil fuels commission report, uh, turns out, unfortunately, it got leaked uh, back in 2002, report uh, from Frank Luntz, a Republican pollster who was advising his clients, uh, the Republican Party, but also fossil fuel interests, that there was a disappearing window of opportunity. Um, the American public was becoming convinced that there was a scientific consensus about climate change, uh, human-caused climate change. And if they were to become convinced that this was a problem, they would demand policy action. But, he said, based on his focus groups and the polling that he had done, there was still a narrow window of opportunity left to reinsert doubt into the discussion, to manufacture uncertainty and controversy, to hire paid advocates with impressive scientific credentials who would challenge the mainstream science. Um, to establish, uh, you know, lavishly funded front groups and organizations um, to, in essence, manufacture a disinformation campaign to discredit the science of climate change. Now, if it sounds familiar to you as a tactic, it may be because it's exactly what the tobacco industry did decades ago. It's the same playbook, um, and it's being used today by fossil fuel interests. There's a wonderful book by my friend Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, Merchants of Doubt, that talks about how the modern campaign to deny climate change really has its roots in earlier campaigns like the campaign to deny the health impacts of tobacco. The difference is that tobacco was about the impact of the health of individual human beings. What we're talking about here is the health of the entire planet. So we have powerful senators, Politicians like James Inhofe, senior senator of Oklahoma, um, the hottest state ever as of uh, two years ago, summer 2011. It broke the record for the warmest ever state any state has ever been. Sorry, Texas. And that summer, he was continuing to declare climate change the single greatest hoax ever perpetrated by the American people. Now, <clears throat> it was statements like that that uh, made him the choice to be the featured speaker at the Heartland Institute Climate Change Conference. The Heartland Institute is an industry-funded think tank um, that uh, was denying the health impacts of tobacco decades uh, ago and today is advocating for the fossil fuel industry, 
Um, they also run smear campaigns against renewable energy to try to defeat uh, the only uh, competitor to fossil fuel interests. In fact, the group ALEC, I know some of you here in Wisconsin are familiar with ALEC, um, is um, heavily uh, involved, um, uh, works with or organizations like the Heartland Institute. Um, in fact, they have some common uh, funders, uh, a couple of brothers from Kansas, um, who some of you may know here, Wisconsin. <laughs> fund these efforts, and he was their keynote speaker. He was chosen to be the keynote speaker in their annual climate change conference, um, and he gladly accepted that, but he, he did have to back out at the last minute, unfortunately. He had gotten ill swimming in a lake back in his uh, home state of Oklahoma. It was suffering from an algal bloom as a result of the unprecedented heat and drought that Oklahoma <laughs> was experiencing at the time, so he did have to cancel out. Well, so now, you might ask, you know, this, how did I find myself in the center of this circus? Because at some level, that's really what this is, this claim that there's a debate about climate change. Uh, the idea that um, you know, climate change is a hoax. How did I find myself at the center of this debate? And it was because of this graph that I published a decade and a half ago that came to be known as the hockey stick because of its shape. It demonstrates the unprecedented nature of recent warming. And it became an icon in the climate change debate. It was featured in the summary for policymakers of the third assessment report uh, of the IPCC in 2001. And as happens to icons in the climate change debate, they get attacked by some of those interests that I talked about. Uh, and it doesn't matter that there's a variable hockey league now, which is to say, and this is something Wisconsin folks can appreciate when you talk about hockey and hockey sticks and hockey leagues. Now, there is a veritable hockey league, dozens of these sorts of reconstructions now. They all come to the conclusion that recent warming really does appear to be unprecedented as far back as we can go. Um, and even if this entire hockey league didn't exist, as you already know, it wouldn't matter. We still have multiple independent lines of evidence that tell us that the planet is warming and that humans are responsible for it and that there will be risks increasingly if we don't do something about it. But because the hockey stick became this sort of icon in the climate change debate, those looking to discredit the science felt that if they could just take down this iconic curve, then they could claim that the entire reason for concern over climate change has evaporated because the one piece of evidence supporting the science of climate change, the hockey stick, one 15-year-old study uh, first authored by a, a postdoc, a postdoctoral researcher, which I was back in the 90s. That's the entire basis for uh, the scientific understanding of climate change. If we can just discredit that one graphic, in fact, let's just discredit that one person, that one author. Let's just discredit him. And then claim to the public that the entire cause for concern has evaporated. Well, you know, maybe they would have what they were looking for just a year ago. So a new study came out. The most comprehensive study of its sort, more than 80, or nearly 80 scientists from around the world um, using the most comprehensive database of paleoclimate data spanning past centuries. And they published, this team of 80 scientists from around the world published this new reconstruction, a new estimate of how temperatures had varied over the past thousand years. And as we were afraid, um, they completely overturned our Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's right. No, they, they got the same result we had gotten 15 years ago. Um, and in fact, the IPCC in its most recent report concluded that in fact, um, the recent warmth is probably unprecedented in at least 1,400 years. One study, well, anyways, so. What I've talked about, you know, the attacks against the hockey stick, uh, you know, folks like James Inhofe, the Heartland Institute, many would call this politicization of the science. I prefer a different term. I think what we're talking about is the scientization of politics, and it's something far worse. It is the way that science is now used as a political football. Um, it is just another way of waging politics, the abuse of science. And, you know, if you don't like the conclusion of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, founded by a Republican, uh, Abraham Lincoln, back in the 19th century, if you don't like the, their conclusion or the conclusion of all of the national academies of all the major industrial nations, or all the science societies in the U.S., 
um, more, than, more than 30 of them, that deal in the various of the underlying uh, aspects of science of climate change, the American Physical Society, American Chemical Society, American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, and so on. If you don't like what the world scientists have determined, you know, there's an entire cable network available to you um, <laughs> that is willing to present an alternative universe where the laws of physics no longer apply, and people are increasingly able to, to trap themselves in, in, in that bubble. Um, and so, you know, you have people like Joe Barton. Um, he was the former chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Back in 2005, um, when I was just leaving the University of Virginia for a new position at Penn State University, I got a letter from Joe, uh, Joe Barton. Uh, actually, sir, no, it, it was a subpoena. It was a congressional subpoena, actually. <laughs> and he wanted to get a hold, and this may sound familiar, it will sound familiar by the time I'm done, of my, all of my personal emails from my entire career, um, and those of my two senior uh, co-authors of the original hockey stick paper, whose careers go back decades, based on the fact that he had read a criticism of our work in that uh, most prestigious of journals, the uh, editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, um, and wanted to use that as justification for an open-ended fishing expedition, to try to look for something in all my personal emails, something to discredit me, Again, to Wisconsin folks, university, it might sound a little familiar. Maybe you've had an episode like that, uh, Cronin. Anyway, so I'll get back to that. Um, well, that was not looked upon kindly by the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, you know, they saw this as a transparent effort to intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests that fund his campaigns. And, and yes, it probably is a coincidence that he was lar the largest recipient uh, of fossil fuel money in the U.S. House of Representatives. The American Meteorological Society, AGU, the journal Nature all denounced you know, this attack. And it might not be uh, surprising to you that someone like Henry Waxman, a progressive Southern California Democrat who had led the effort to bring the, to uh, the tobacco industry to justice decades ago for hiding the health impacts of their product, that he would come out and defend us against the attack of his um, a Republican colleague, uh, Joe Barton. But what might surprise you is that the biggest hero in the story ended up being a Republican, uh, Sherwood Bullard, who was an old school pro-science, pro-environment uh, Republican. He was the chair of another powerful House committee, the House Science Committee. And he denounced his fellow Republican, Joe Barton's attacks on it. It's not just sh uh, short of, um, calling it, and this is a term that you can appreciate in, in Wisconsin, uh, stop just short of, uh, of calling him out for engaging in modern day McCarthyism. Um, and he wasn't the only prominent Republican to do so. You might recognize that guy. He wrote an op-ed in the Chronicle of Higher Education at the time, where he said, the message sent by the Congressional Committee to the three scientists was not subtle. Publish politically unpalatable scientific results, embrace yourself for political retribution, it represents a kind of intimidation which threatens the relationship between science and public policy. That behavior must not be tolerated. Almost unprecedented in modern American political life to see one prominent Republican call out another prominent Republican in such harsh terms publicly. Um, and it didn't stop there, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> now, I never get a chance to even say anything. I, so, it didn't stop there. As many of you know, the so-called climate gate scandal unfolded in uh, late 2009. And again, I'm sure it was a coincidence. It had to be a coincidence that it was in the weeks leading up to the single greatest opportunity for meaningful progress on climate change in, in years, the uh, Copenhagen summit. Um, thousands of emails had been released. Actually, no, they were stolen off of a university server in the UK. And they were combed through, and individual words and phrases were taken from those emails and strung together in ways to try to make it sound like uh, scientists were cooking the books and, the, and that the scientists, climate scientists, were engaged in all matters of indiscretion. And Sarah Palin at the time, oops, wrote uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post where she said, among other things, that these emails revealed that climate scientists were trying to hide the decline in global temperature. It's a fascinating assertion because I actually know the email she was talking about. I was a recipient of that email. It was from a colleague of mine in the UK. And it was in early 1999. And as the climate scientists in the audience know that, 
that's the, the warmest the globe had been. You know, 1998 was the warmest year we had ever seen. It was spiked by a big El Nino event. And by the way, it looks like we may get another big El Nino event this next year. Um, and I'm already predicting that we will see a new global temperature record next year. Well, so if anything, climate scientists then would have been talking about the acceleration in, in global warming. What these scientists were talking about was a curve the curve they were constructing for the cover of, of a government report that was supposed to depict, depict temperature trends in the past. And one of them was based on tree ring data that, that were known to be bad after 1960. And there was a whole, they had published a paper in the journal Nature a year earlier about this enigmatic, enigmatic problem known as the divergence problem where these trees stop responding to temperatures after the 1960s or so. And maybe it has something to do with pollution. There are various theories for why that might be true, but it was known that those data were not reliable after 1960. And so they were just talking about getting rid of the misleading data in that graphic. Um, and I explained this and some of the other things that Sarah Palin had gotten wrong in her op-ed, in my own op-ed that the Washington Post published nine days later. And it seems to have had an impact even on Sarah Palin because she said, these are her words, okay? She said, a lot of those emails obviously weren't meant for public consumption, okay? And that they could be misinterpreted if taken out of context. Of course, she was referring to her own emails that had been released in response to a Freedom of Information Act request from her time as governor of Alaska. Well, it didn't stop there. James Inhofe saw these stolen emails as cause to prosecute 17 climate scientists. He couldn't come up with 57, like in the movie The Manchurian Candidate. But he was able to come up with 17 climate scientists who should be prosecuted for you know, the hoax of climate change is revealed by these stolen emails. Uh, and by the way, now, I think there now have been 10 different investigations in the US and the, and the UK, um, and they've all found that these emails revealed no indiscretions, no wrongdoing, no fudging of data. The only wrongdoing at all that could be found was the criminal theft of those emails in the first place. Well, but don't let facts get in the way of a good smear campaign. So James Inhofe, decided this was justification to prosecute a list of 17 climate scientists. I'm happy to say I was on that list along with uh, Presidential Medal of Science winner Susan Solomon of MIT. But it didn't stop there. It, it really didn't. Uh, that fall, newly minted Tea Party <coughs> Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, you know, is taking over uh, the reins, Attorney General of Virginia, spring uh, 2010. And in his first act as Attorney General, he, oh wait, I'm sorry, that's right. Now his first act was actually to censor the state seal because it exposed a certain part of the anatomy of the Roman goddess Virtus, and he didn't think that was a good thing. It was his second act as Attorney General was actually <laughs> to take a page from the Joe Barton playbook and use his authority as Attorney General to use a civil investigative demand which is actually provided to the Attorney General um, as a means of ferreting out state waste and fraud, typically Medicare fraud. But he reasoned that since when I was at the University of Virginia from 1999 to 2005, and I was engaged in the science of climate change, and that's clearly fraudulent science, this was a perfectly appropriate application of the civil investigative demand. And so he wanted all of my, starting to get, starting to sound a little familiar now, all of my personal emails with 39 different climate scientists around the world. Um, well, you know, the Union of Concerned Scientists wasn't too impressed by that, nor was the American Association of University Professors or the ACLU or even the conservative group FIRE, you know, that advocates for typically conservative academic causes. They advocate against uh, what they see as political correctness in academia, for example. But they didn't like the idea of a, you know, attorney general who could go after academics whose views he didn't like. It doesn't matter what your politics are, whether you're conservative or progressive. The idea that an attorney general could simply go after an academic whose ideas he didn't like. Um, they didn't think that was a good thing. Nor did uh, 800, a petition of 800 scientists from around the state of Virginia, and I didn't know there were 800 scientists in the state of Virginia, but apparently they denounced this effort once again by a politician to try to apparently intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests that fund his campaign. American Meteorological Society Journal Nature all came out. Richmond Times Dispatch, a, a 
conservative uh, newspaper um, that had endorsed his candidacy uh, called him out in pretty harsh terms. Um, in fact, for the first time ever, uh, the Richmond Times Dispatch in this last uh, Virginia governor's election did not endorse the Republican candidate for governor. That was Ken Cuccinelli. Um, they made no endorsement. I campaigned actively for his opponent, uh, Terry McAuliffe. Um, and Terry won. And the Washington Post, you know, they didn't uh, really like what Cuccinelli was up to. They called it a, a fishing expedition, a witch hunt. They wrote five editorials about this. Their cartoonist, the award-winning cartoonist Tom Tolles, really couldn't resist uh, weighing in on the, manner, uh, the matter, published two, uh, two cartoons. Uh, this is my favorite, I have to confess. This is Ken Cuccinelli up there in the judge's chair. And he wants to see this guy's emails, too. It's poor Galileo down below. And I don't mind being compared to Galileo, I have to confess. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, and so the lower court quashed Cuccinelli's subpoena, really on a technicality. Um, in his 40-page filing to the court, he had forgotten to um, provide some evidence of wrongdoing on my part. Uh, <laughs> and so they, they threw it out. But he appealed, of course, to the state Supreme Court, um, which threw out the case with prejudice, um, meaning that they really don't want to see an attorney general ever come back to the court with something like that today. But there's another development that I have to talk about uh, today that involves the Virginia um, Supreme Court. Because it turns out another group, when Cuccinelli's uh, attempts failed, a group that calls itself the American Traditional, uh, Tradition Institute, um, largely uh, funded by the Koch brothers. Um, in fact, several of the people who work for the American Tradition Institute also work for the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which is a Koch-funded uh, front group. Um, and they're closely related to ALEC, which is also heavily funded by the Koch brothers, which, uh, as I recall, had some role in a Freedom of Information Act request at, at some university in the Midwest um, involving uh, an environmental historian. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Bill Cronin. The same, the same people. This is the same, organ the same organization, same people. Um, he had you know, written, in a, written a blog post criticizing ALEC, and uh, within a few days he found himself subject to um, a, a Freedom of Information Act from the state um, Republican Party. Uh, most of whom actually are members of ALEC, as I understand it. Um, well, today, so the lower court threw out the American Tradition Institute's attempt to, you know, get all my personal emails. That also made its way all the way to the state Supreme Court, which ruled today in our favor. They affirmed the lower court's uh, finding. They weighed in in favor of academic freedom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this uh, now hopefully sets a precedent. This is uh, the first time that I think a state Supreme Court has weighed in on this matter of uh, whether uh, professors' personal emails are considered public documents. And they decided they are not public documents available before. So let, let's hope that that has some uh, wider reverberations. Well, so, you know, we've seen that there are a number of bad faith actors, um, and some of them, perhaps most of them are in one party, but some of the heroes are, are in that party, too. And uh, Sherwood Bullard, um, just a few years ago, um, he had stepped down. Um, he was no longer in Congress. He had chosen not to run again because he knew he was going to be primaried by an opponent uh, who would be well-funded um, by a, a couple of brothers from Kansas. Um, and so he was no longer in Congress, but he was still making his views known in the form of op-eds to the Washington Post, where he warned his fellow scientists who had threatened a whole new round of show trials, of efforts to discredit climate scientists, that if they go down that road, if the Republican Party, his party, continues to go down this road, that they uh, risk forever um, establishing the Republican Party as the party of anti-science. And they better not go down that road. And their increasing number of Republicans, uh, sometimes surprising, folks like uh, Grover Norquist, the anti-tax crusader Grover Norquist, who at least for 24 hours indicated that he was potentially in favor of a, a revenue-neutral carbon tax, a tax-neutral carbon tax. Well, don't applaud yet, because it only lasted about 24 hours. Apparently, he 
too got a call uh, from uh, one of two brothers in Kansas um, and reversed his position shortly thereafter. But we are seeing a larger number of policymakers from the conservative side of the aisle who are coming out and, and saying, you know, we, we don't want to be grouped with the forces of anti-science. Uh, we, we, we don't want to stand for anti-science. We don't want our party to stand for anti-science. There's a worthy debate to be had here about what policies to put in place to deal with climate change. And let's make sure that conservative principles are, are reflected in that discussion. Let's have that discussion. Let's not have that fake discussion about whether climate change exists. The official position of the uh, House Science Committee, by the way, is that climate change is a hoax. That's the current uh, position of the uh, Republican leadership of the House Science Committee. They also think that uh, evolution is a hoax as well. <laughs> but there are a larger number, a larger and larger number of, of their colleagues who are coming out and saying, no, you know, we can't, we can't be the party of anti-science. We can have a, a, a real debate about the policy solutions. And, and let's talk about, you know, revenue neutral carbon taxes, free market, you know, uh, vehicles for pricing carbon. But let's recognize that there is a threat here, that there are risks, and we need to deal with them in good faith. And I hope, and I think, that it could just be a matter of, uh, you know, a few years where this discussion finds itself in a very different place and where we can have that good faith discussion that we need to have about what to do about the problem. And that gives me some optimism that we will get on to talking about this very real and difficult, you know, issue of how do we satisfy growing global demand for energy in a way that doesn't continue to degrade our planet. Um, and you know, let's put all options on the table. Let's have a debate about the, the role that natural gas could play in the transition to a fossil fuel free future. Um, there are credible estimates that you know, 30 years from now, we could meet 85% of projected uh, energy demand here in the US entirely from renewable energy. Uh, but there's this transition you know, to get there, there's a bridge that we need. Uh, maybe natural gas play, uh, will play a role, that maybe it shouldn't. Let's have that debate. <clears throat> Nuclear, maybe that plays a role, but maybe it shouldn't. Let's have that debate. We're talking about different choices that each come with their own footprint of risk. Let's have that discussion of risk management, of, of, uh, of how we get to that, you know, how we rapidly um, transition away from our reliance on fossil fuels. Because to me, ultimately, it isn't just a problem of science or a problem of economics, you know, cost-benefit analysis, or a problem of, of politics or, or policy. To me, it's a problem of ethics. It's a problem, uh, for example, of intergenerational ethics. That's my daughter, the Pittsburgh Zoo. Um, and that is a polar bear above her. And no, we aren't torturing her, uh, I promise. <laughs> At the Pittsburgh Zoo, you can walk through a plexiglass tunnel underneath the polar bear feeding pool. And if uh, you're involved in an NSF-funded project to develop climate change outreach for zoos and aquaria across the country, and you happen to know the manager of the zoo, you might be able to get him to throw the fish in the pool when your daughter is walking through, which is what's <laughs> happening here. But on, on a serious note, um, you know, I would hate to think that you know we're leaving behind a world, um, you know, for. My daughter, you know, decades from now, might return to this zoo with her children or her grandchildren and point to these amazing creatures and talk about how they used to exist in the wild, but we literally melted their home. And uh, that's a world that we can still avoid, a, a world where there are fundamental challenges uh, for meeting uh, our food and, and water and, 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 and land uh, resource requirements um, uh, where uh, we have, you know, uh, human health uh, epidemics made worse by climate change, a world where we've lost 25% of our animal species, a, a fundamentally degraded planet. Um, there's still time to avoid having that be our legacy, um, but there isn't a whole lot of time. Uh, there is a great urgency now for us to transition away from our escalating carbon emissions um, so that we can avoid catastrophic climate change and so that we can avoid leaving behind a fundamentally degraded planet for our children and grandchildren. So I'll leave it on that note. I'll be happy to field questions. Thank you.
about 15 minutes of questions. This morning I had the misfortune of having my half an hour meeting time with Michael Mann canceled. And I was kind of despondent about that most of the day until now I find out that I was that it was sacrificed on the altar of academic freedom. I'm happy to do that, right? Congratulations, Michael. like to do this is if you've got questions, I'll just come and find you with the mic, and when you use the mic, get it right up in your mouth. See how it's up here like this? You don't sit down here, you can't hear it. You gotta go like that. Okay, so we'll start with questions. I'll start over here. We've talked a little about uh, the political situation in the U.S. with regard to the reaction to climate change, and of course, historically, we're one of the biggest contributors to climate change. Um, these days, the biggest contributors appear to be the Chinese, and I'm wondering if you know anything about the political situation with regard to climate change in China. Thanks. It's a great question, and it's a, a point that... Um, did everyone hear the, the question? Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it's remarkable to me that the U.S., you know, we've always prided ourselves as leading the world when it comes to technology um, and here we're falling behind the rest of the world because even China and India and uh, developing nations recognize that you know, clean energy is the future uh, of you know, the global economy. And yes, it's true that China you know, is building a coal-fired power plant every five days or so, although apparently that is decreasing quite a bit now. There's a decreasing trend. Um, but they're also investing uh, quite a bit more in renewable energy technology and solar and wind uh, technology right now. And in China, believe it or not, uh, they're having a serious discussion about implementing a carbon tax, okay? They're not debating whether climate change exists. Um, they're talking about what to do about it. So it, by that measure, we're actually behind uh, China and much of the rest of the world. Now, there is, you know, Part of the challenge of, of, of solving this problem is that you know, we have different parties with, with different in interests and different legacies. We have a legacy of two centuries of access to cheap, dirty energy. Okay, we, have, you know, we have obviously profited from that. And uh, who are we to tell other nations you know, what choices they should be making, energy choices they should be making, if we don't have our own house in order, if we're not willing to make a commitment ourselves to making good faith policy decisions to decrease our carbon emissions, that makes it very difficult it, 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 for us to have the sort of moral authority to be talking with China and India and other developing nations who could reasonably argue, you had two centuries of, of access to this stuff. Don't, shouldn't we have our turn? And who are we to say, no, you shouldn't? if we're not willing to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Um, so that, that's my perspective on that. As a person who considers the scenarios of climate change extremely likely, it's my observation that the people who are worried about economic ramifications are usually given sh short shrift. Um, to me, it seems uh, almost as prudent to assume horrendous economic impacts if we get at all serious about curbing our carbon emissions. It's, it's really almost as prudent to assume that as to assume, um, or to, prudent to assume that as to assume that the evidence and everything is that the, we're, we're headed uh, in for bad things. And when I hear uh, uh, Climate activists saying, oh, you know, carbon tax will take care of I think, by the way, I support carbon tax. But I think that the relationship we have with all this carbon, all, all our expectations right now are based on we just get to full carbon. Or let's say 90% of our expectations of energy right now are tied to some of the carbon. Okay. I'm just wondering whether you have any thoughts on. How to take that more seriously other than say, well, oh, some jobs will come rattling out of the economy and oh so you know you lose all your value of your oil wells, you know, too bad, something else will come along. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, so, you know, there are a number of economists, uh, some of the, you know, the leading economists in the country, like uh, William Nordhaus of Yale, who have uh, spent 
you know, made a career out of studying the economics of uh, you know, sort of the cost-benefit analysis approach to climate change and looking at you know, the, the very real, um, uh, to when you put a tax you know, on a product, obviously you decrease consumption, you're going to increase the cost. Um, that has an economic uh, impact. Um, so there's a cost of taking action, but there's also a cost of inaction. And what even the most conservative uh, economists will tell you, the most conservative econ uh, economists like uh, Bill Nordhaus, who sort of make assumptions that are in the more conservative uh, regime in terms of the costs, the damages of climate change. Even William Nordhaus will tell you that right now, the impacts, the cost of inaction is already greater than the cost of action. It will become much larger, but it's already greater than the cost of action so that it makes sense to mitigate now against impacts that we commit to if we continue to uh, emit carbon. It's sort of the example that my uh, good friend and, and uh, fortunately no longer with us, uh, a colleague, Steve Schneider, um, Stanford University, used to frame this in terms of it's a planetary insurance policy, okay? So there's uncertainty in the science, right? Um, there are things could maybe not be as bad as the models currently project, but there's a lot of evidence that is now coming in suggesting that some things may actually be worse than we were predicting. Arctic sea ice is declining far faster than the climate models predicted it to. We are seeing loss of ice from the two major ice sheets much earlier than the models said we should see. That means they're contributing to sea level rise earlier than they should. Um, we are seeing that the uncertainty may not be cutting in our favor. It may be cutting against us. And it's the same sort of uncertainty when you purchase fire insurance, you don't purchase fire insurance because you think your house is going to burn down. None of us thinks that our house is going to burn down. But we know that in that very low probability event, the impact would be catastrophic. And it turns out that the product of that low probability and that catastrophic impact is a large enough number that it says we should spend now to avoid that potential catastrophe. We should invest now, whether it's a fire insurance when we're talking about our homes or whether it's a planetary insurance policy when we're talking about climate change mitigation. Sir, I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Um, would you care to comment on House Resolution number 2413? The Probably not. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh I, I'm not familiar with So this is, um, this is a recently, yeah, there was a, uh, is this the, the recent um, resolution to, uh, to actually redirect funds from climate research to... Oh, shooting the message. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, this, so, you know, that's exactly, I, I wasn't sure that was the resolution you're talking about. So there's a recent House resolution. It sounds, you know, when you read the title, so who wouldn't want to support, you know, improving our, uh, you know, sort of like Americans for Prosperity. Who wouldn't be for prosperity? Who would think that that's a, a Koch brothers front group um, that advocates against doing something about climate change? Now, I'm all for prosperity, and I'm all for improving you know, our weather forecasting infrastructure. But what that bill actually is suggesting is that we just stop funding anything related to climate. It's you know, the put the fingers in your ears approach to dealing with the problem that we've seen too much of in Congress. Um, so thanks for the, for the question. I think the alternative there, too, is to just let the weather scientists help you out in the climate science world. We're coming together anyway, so that's another option. We can do it under the table. Can you explain what is in the models which cause the, uh, the sharp dips, the occasional sharp dips? Oh, yeah. So. Uh, we see, you know, fairly sharp dips in temperature uh, associated with large volcanic eruptions, and there are, you know, a half dozen climatically relevant. Uh, but you can't predict the volcano. No, no. So you're talking about drops in the uh, dips in which in the past. For example, wasn't there a dip? Uh, from, weren't there sharp dips in the future predicted by the earlier models? Yeah. Uh, there, there are fluctuations. So the models do show fluctuations. They show cooling fluctuations and warming fluctuations. And you know, in the in the real world, there's both external factors, natural factors like volcanic eruptions and solar output changes. But we we can't forecast those in, into the future. But the other factor, and I alluded to it uh, earlier, El Nino is a, a very prominent influence. Um, a big El Nino event can raise the global mean temperature by a couple tenths of a degree C. Now that might sound small. But when you figure that global warming is less than 0.2 degrees C over a decade, 
then those individual fluctuations due to things like El Nino and, and La Nina are pretty large. It's only when you average over time that they average out and you, know, you see the, the, the warming trend uh, emerge very clearly. But if you're looking at year-to-year -year fluctuations in temperature, um, things like El Nino and La Nina, just random events that come and go, you know, it's the weather of the climate system, uh, that, sh that, that has an impact on global temperature, uh, in addition to things like volcanic eruptions and solar output changes. And the climate model simulations into the future, those models do produce El Ninos and they produce La Ninas, and so you see fluctuations related to that. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Do you believe that we have the three-year buffer, or the few-year buffer for the Republicans to change, um, to see reality in order to make the necessary changes that we have to make? <laughs> well, you know, I think that the, the Republican Party has to decide what it stands for. And I think right now, you know, I, I don't like to get too political. And I have good friends who are Republicans, you know, and good friends who are Democrats. And, and I know that they all care as much about their children and grandchildren. They all want to leave the world, the best world behind. I recently had an exchange on Twitter with Dana Rohrabacher. Um, he's a Southern California Republican who's probably the, the most vocal climate change denier in Congress right now. And, um, and, and we had a friendly uh, exchange on Twitter um, where I said, you know, Dana, I'm sure you care about as much about you know, your ch grandchildren as, you know, as anyone else I know. And, and we ought to have a good faith discussion about this. And by the way, you should see this new Showtime series, uh, Years of Living Dangerously, that is co-produced by your fellow Southern California Republican, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if he watches it. Uh, by the way, I'm a science advisor, all you know, in full disclosure for, for the series. Uh, but for those of you who haven't uh, caught it, the first uh, episode is available streaming on the internet. You can watch it. It's amazing. It's you know, Indiana Jones meets you know, an inconvenient truth. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you publicly, as I'm sure many people would, um, for sticking your guns. Thanks. for braving some of the uh, political issues that you've had to face. Um, Thank you. And I also appreciate the humor, uh, dry as it may be, uh, on the issues. I think we all take it's climate change. <laughs> some comfort once in a while for feeling somewhat mitigated, somewhat sense of, okay, we're on the right page here. Um, but when some people face difficult truths, difficult facts laid before them, they put their hands over their ears, they, they're fearful. Um, and sometimes fear looks an awful lot like grief. Yeah. And um, there are other people when they, when they face something that is particularly challenging new information, it makes them curious and it makes them move toward it. And I'm just curious from your perspective, how to amplify uh, the voices of lay people, uh, fellow scientists, who are in that latter category, and how best to leverage or, or move people who might be somewhere between the two in the direction of, of facing these issues in a way that gives us a chance to take a responsible action as opposed to a fearful and, and just self-preserving action. Thank you. Thanks. No, it's, a, it's a great point and a great question. I mean, you know, the, the danger, you know, is that um, sometimes, uh, you know, if people feel, um, you know, that they're powerless um, and, and to do something about this problem, uh, then, you know, one of the potential outcomes is denial. You know, if, if you're faced with some problem that you have no way of dealing with, uh, sometimes that leads to denial. And some of the denial, not necessarily of, of the fundamental science, um, you know, of the, but perhaps denial that this is really something we need to worry about, or this is really something that I should be focusing my energy on when, you know, frankly, I'm having trouble putting food on the table or what have you. Um, and bread and butter issues that we're dealing with daily, and this can sometimes feel like a a very abstract problem. And so I think that's part of the challenge. Part of the problem is that this feels too abstract. It feels too distant. Um, it doesn't feel pressing enough. And you know, to return to this Showtime series, what it's really about is actually trying to reframe the discussion uh, of climate change, um, how it's affecting people. And it tells, you know, it's a storytelling. Um, you know, it's engaged in, in, in narratives about, you know, 
you know, firefighters jumping into wildfires, uh, risking their lives um, to combat, you know, ever worse wildfires because of increased heat and drought. Um, you know, it, it, there are people who are increasingly risking their lives because of the impacts of climate change. Or farmers that are dealing with the devastation of droughts and heat waves that have destroyed their crops. Um, the first episode featured an evangelical Christian in Texas. Her name's uh, uh, Catherine Hayhoe. And uh, she's a fellow climate scientist, a very respected climate scientist. She's also an evangelical Christian. And she travels around lecturing to very conservative um, evangelical you know, to church uh, audiences in the heart of the deepest red parts of Texas. Um, and she's changing minds because she's getting them to realize, uh, for example, that there is no inconsistency between you know, their religious faith and the acceptance of the science of climate change. In fact, the Bible preaches stewardship of the earth. The Bible says just the opposite of what some in the evangelical community have tried to convince their, you know, their, their fellow Christians. Uh, and so I think a lot of it is about reframing the debate. Uh, you know, uh, four-star generals, you know, um, the, the head of the uh, Navy's Pacific Command has indicated that climate change is the greatest natural, uh, national security threat that we face in the decades ahead. And that raises some eyebrows. People who might not otherwise think that climate change is something they should care about, they might dismiss it as a concern of the environmental left. Uh, but when they start seeing the mil military and hearing that the Pentagon has a plan to deal with the increasing dangers, national security dangers, increased conflict, uh, the Syrian spring, for example, um, some have suggested might have been a result of drought that was and heat that was intensified by climate change. Getting people to think about this issue in a different way from the, the way they might have thought about it before, I think, is one fruitful avenue. Time for two more questions, I think. Thank you for your courageous persistence. Thanks. Yes. Here, here. Thank you. <laughs> small symposium on climate change in South Africa this Monday. And one of the students said, well, how much more science do we need to refine things? And I said, well, as you said, it's 200 years old. We have the science we need to act. So the challenge as a non-scientist I would lay out to the scientists is, can you leave the weasel words behind, grab the media by the lapel, and say, there's no dispute, A, B, C, do this. Because the science, the media looks for the weasel words to perpetuate the non-debate and sell those papers. Well, thanks. Um, you know, uh, you're... <laughs> To, to continue with the, uh, the church analogy, you're sort of preaching to the choir on that. I, I ha happen to agree with you wholeheartedly. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few months ago, um, which was, see, if you see something, say something. And it was a call uh, to arms, uh, my fellow scientists, that we have a responsibility as those who are first -hand, have first-hand knowledge and understanding of the dimensions of this problem, that it is our responsibility to inform the public discussion and we have to be effective communicators. We have to learn to not lead with our uncertainty. You know, scientists love to lead with what they don't know. Communications experts will tell you that's the worst possible thing you can do. It's exactly the opposite of what an effective communication strategy is. You start out with what we know and what's most important. And then you can get into the nuances. You can layer it. In, in some degree of nuance. Uh, I like to point out, for example, we know the globe is warming. We know it's due to human, uh, act, you know, uh, human activity, greenhouse gases from carbon emissions. And we know that it represents a threat. Now, if you want to ask me about, well, what is the precise impact on Atlantic hurricanes uh, going to be? Will there be more of them or less of them? Um, what about this unusual jet stream pattern that we saw this winter? Could climate change have been playing a role in that? That gets into much more nuanced issues. And, and there is a, a legitimate scientific debate about these issues. And if you go to the AGU meeting, you will see scientists debating back and forth on these specifics. But the big picture, we, we knew two centuries ago, as you say. Um, the fact that climate change 
is real, is caused by us, and represents a threat, that's not in dispute. That's the conclusion of the US National Academy of Sciences, all the major academies, all those science, uh, scientific societies in the US that, as I mentioned, have all concluded that climate change is real, it's caused by us, it represents a threat if we don't do something about it. That is the message that we should be communicating. And before we get to our last question, I'm sorry, we just don't have time for everybody's questions, but there is going to be a reception in the uh, lobby, and you're all welcome to attend that. When you leave this room, though, be sure to take all your personal belongings, because the door is locked behind us, and we can't get back in uh, to retrieve them. So don't leave anything behind. And Professor Mann will be signing his book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, in the lobby as well, so you get a chance to talk to him and maybe take a look at the book. Uh, so let's go with one last question. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Um, you highlighted some of the political issues with the, in the United States, and you know we know about some of the things that are more on a global level, the discussion between developed and undeveloped nations, or developing nations, rather. Um, so I guess my question would be, is it possible to, to get around the, the, the government as a means of um, finding solutions? So when we look at the whole solution to all of the things that we need to do, um, going forward, can we rely on private institutions or non-governmental organizations to get it done, or do we have to have the government make the big decisions? Thanks. It's a great question. It's a great one to conclude with. Um, you know, because uh, right now we're in a position, you know, what we really would like to see, what we ultimately need is a comprehensive, you know, uh, energy and, and climate bill. Um, and passed by Congress. And we're probably not going to see that in the immediate future. Um, in you know, the absence of that, uh, you know, there are executive actions that the President has taken that are meaningful, um, you know, more stringent uh, standards for coal emission, uh, carbon emissions from coal-fired power plants. There are a number of things that the administration, a number of executive actions that the EPA, um, that, the, uh, you know, that the, the President has uh, taken to try to do what he can about this problem. What we'd really like to see is, you know, a price on carbon, a, a, car, a, a climate bill passed the Congress. But, you know, in the absence of that, there are executive actions um, that can help a little bit. Um, and there's a lot that can be done at the local level, the municipal level, the state level. And what we're starting to see is in the absence of leadership at the highest level, congressional leadership, States are starting to band together. Um, the West Coast states, California, um, under Jerry Brown, uh, Washington and Oregon have banded together and they are trying to develop a, a, carbon, uh, a, a carbon emissions uh, trading scheme. Um, New England states you know, may band together. Um, and what you might see is enough of these consortiums at the state level, the municipal level, the local level, all the way up to the state level to groups of states acting together where there's a large enough market share involved that you know, the energy industry has to pay attention. And so we may see solutions come sort of from the bottom up, at least for the meantime, in the absence of a top-down solution. Uh, but really, in my view, we need to have the infrastructure um, so that when we do get a change in the congressional leadership, we're primed to act on this problem quickly. And I think there's a lot that can be done there as well, so that we're ready to hit the road running when the congr congressional leadership is there. Um, it doesn't you know, take, uh, it's amazing how quickly the public consciousness can shift uh, on any number of matters. And, and we saw that with marriage equality uh, recently, a fundamental change in the perception of the American public on this issue um, over a course of less than a year um, as the according to the polls. Um, and we may see that with climate change as well. And that may force the hand of uh, other you know, legislators who would otherwise rather do the bidding of uh, certain vested interests rather than what's right for the people they're supposed to represent. So we just have to continue to, to push forward. And a solution, you know, I, I think, is nearer than we realize. Thanks. Professor Mann, can I have one more question from sure. State Senator Lockmiller, who happens to be in the audience? Oh, side. sure. Thank you very much, and I greatly appreciate it. I struggled with some of the same issues, but on the political side. Um, and one of my frustrations has been a scientist who had been intimidated by their institution to soft pedal their findings and their testimony uh, before public 
uh, decision-making bodies. Uh, I think one of the solutions has to be for the scientists to unite and not stand up for it and say, you know, it is our responsibility to provide this information and to do it in a way that helps the decision makers make the right decision and to wield the public opinion in support of the sound science that you represent. Could you comment on, on that aspect of academic freedom? Thanks very much. Um, and, and let me thank you uh, as well because, you know, I've described some of the experiences that I've been through, but I was never forced uh, to leave my state. <laughs> to, to, to <laughs> And so my, my hat off to you, um, and, and thanks for that question, because you know too often there's the explicit intimidation, um, you know scientists who are threatened directly, uh, whether you know it's by you know powerful politicians or uh, special interest groups who bombard them with vexatious demands for personal emails um, when they say things that they don't like. Uh, but there's, uh, I think, a, a more pernicious undercurrent of intimidation that causes many of our fellow scientists to second guess themselves. Um, you know, scientists who would otherwise want to participate in the public discourse, who fear that if they you know, do an interview on television news or they write an op-ed in, in the paper, they'll be bombarded uh, with nasty emails and phone messages and, and threats against their life, threats against their family members, or they'll get you know, their department chairs. Uh, or their deans will get a call uh, asking them to do something about their troublesome um, faculty member. Um, so intimidation uh, can take many forms. The good news is that I think as many of us in this room know, you know we academics are a somewhat cantankerous lot <laughs> and we don't take kindly uh, to intimidation efforts and fortunately the University of Wisconsin has been a, a real leader in standing up. They, they stood up um, and defended academic freedom when Tom Cronin was, um, was no, not Bill Cronin. Thing. Tom Cronin is a paleoceanographer. Uh, <laughs> Bill, Bill Cronin you know, uh, was, you know, was, was threatened because of you know, some of what he had to say about Alec. Um, so I, I think that those efforts are starting to backfire. Um, I think this victory in the Supreme Court today, hopefully that will be even more helpful in uh, making it clear that we do have the right to uh, you know, not only do research in areas that might be inconvenient to some special interest, but to speak out publicly about it. I hope that sends a message, a positive message to my fellow scientists. I wrote that op-ed in the New York Times. That was targeted to my fellow scientists. We have a responsibility to do this. And if we don't, and this is the point that I tried to convey, the point I felt was most important, that if we don't, there is a huge opportunity cost. Um, if we choose not to engage in these discussions, we leave a vacuum, and we know who that vacuum will be filled by. It'll be filled by the talking heads who are funded by some of those special interests, some of those brothers from Kansas that we talked about. And, uh, and that's what, you know, so if we choose not to engage, then what that means is that uh, the, the public is not going to get honest and, and, and sober information, the sort of information that they need to make an informed decision about matters that are going to impact not just them, but you know, the, the, their children and their grandchildren. So you know, I, I, I think that fortunately we are seeing you know, academia step up to the plate and, and defend academics who have been under attack. And, and I like to think that that's sending the right message, especially to our younger scientists, that you can. You can do good science and you can also engage in the, in the public discourse. And in fact, you know, it's important for you to do so and you should be rewarded for that. And that's something that we have to think about in the reward system that we have in academia, how we properly reward those academics who do spend an increasingly large amount of their time in outreach and education. Um, that's part of what, what the taxpayers pay us. That's what we should be doing. So, thank you. And we've got a plaque on Baskin Hall. It's been there 120 years and it addresses exactly that. Won't you join me in thanking Michael Mann for his great